None as well. Tired? To stretch a little bit? First of all, um, hands up. Who were on the, um, on the lecture yesterday with uh, Turir? One, two, three. <laughs> Not very impressive, guys. We have the best, probably one of the best coaches in Norway lecturing for you guys at half past three. And none of you shows up, apart from three people. OK, we expect you to come on these things. It was directly linked to your, uh, it was good, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure that you got a lot of uh, links to the psychology course that you've had. Luckily for you, I think it will be online. At least it was taped. But these things uh, are very important that you show up on, although it's not compulsory part of your courses. OK? We need you to be able to have two thoughts in your head at the same time. So just attend those kind of things. Maybe you will complain there was no information. There was. Maybe late still, there was. Where was the info? There was information. Where? Where? On Facebook. No. Not before that. I posted it on the Facebook. Yeah, but I posted it before. Maybe not on the sport management side. Anyway, still, there will be new chances, but we expect you to come next time. OK? And it was a very good lecture. Very good. What did you want to say? What did you want for the information? Yeah, it worked on Facebook. OK. And the Lloyd for here, my Molde's in Facebook side, for example. Oh, Heime's side, and the Molde, and there is a lot of information. Panorama, in the whole thing. So, just try to hold you oriented. OK, uh, there is only one uh, English <laughs> speaking one today, or German. I can't speak German, so. Uh, but we'll still do, still do it in English, of course. The agenda of today is part one, lecture. We're going to have a, a regular lecture, maybe 40 minutes, 45, something like that. We're going to talk about the national federations and also sport for all policies. What are these sport for all policies? The second part, you will get information about the groups and the exam. Um, unfortunately, not all of you are here, but we will work, we will start work in the groups today. Um, not necessarily directly with the exam question, but very related to that. So I want you to start working together and get to know each other as a group. Okay, some of you have probably worked together before. Some of you haven't, but still. Last um, part is the group work. We work with a specific task uh, together in those groups. I will not give you the actual assignment of the exam today. That will come next or on Wednesday, OK? But I will give you information about the exam still. Most of you, or many of you, have have given me um, notes or asked for one person to work together with, and I have uh, I have tried to um, to make the groups according to that. Okay, there was one person sending me a Facebook message yesterday evening, and um, he's not here, but that wasn't possible <laughs> because uh, the groups were already made. And also, good idea. Uh, if you send me emails, um, it's better than Facebook because I don't have the link on the, on the phone. So I don't get the messages all the time. Okay? <coughs> or the, the app, it's called. Any questions this far? No? Good. After lecture today, you should be able to say something about the role of the National Sport Federations. Uh, we are going to talk about um, some of the challenges, the relations, power relations in sport, uh, in NIF and the National Sports Federations. What are their, their major challenges? This part will be on your shoulders, more or less. 
We're going to talk about sports, stakeholders, financing, etc. That will be um, a group assignment. And also these uh, sport for all policies. We will, uh, we will um, talk about them first. But first, some, uh, some, uh, a quick recap, because it's been a while since uh, we talked about this, actually. You remember we talked about the voluntary sector, the voluntary sports sector? What is that? You can use your notes if you don't remember. What is the voluntary sector? What are what other sectors do we have? Rather than the voluntary sector? Anyone? Yes. I don't know what it is in English, but top of bread. Hello the idea do you think for no. on other kids think for that? Mars and offently uh sector. Okay. Yeah, no? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um we have the public sector, the private sector, and we have the voluntary sector as a setup. And we talk about the voluntary sports sector. Sports, the way that we organize sports here in Norway, for instance, is part of what we call the voluntary sector. What characterizes the voluntary sector? That kind of gives itself. Yes? Sorry? The dual system, what do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, in Norway we have a dual system. There's no money involved. There's no money involved. Not there is money involved, but there's yeah. yeah. So what does volunteer mean? What's the what does, what's the meaning of the word volunteer? Volunteer, <coughs> voluntary. Free labor. Free labor. You understand the word volunteer, right? Yes. In English. <coughs> what is the direct translation in Norwegian? Frivillig. Frivillig sector, yeah? Volunteer. You understand that too, right? <laughs> I just, <laughs> just need to know that we're on the same level here. So, voluntary sector, frivillig sector. There is money, but mostly driven by voluntary efforts. Sports is part of the voluntary sector, which means mostly driven by voluntary efforts. And that is, is that a challenge? Can that be challenging? Why? Because in our societies, people get lazier and lazier and they won't don't want to participate in voluntary work. Yeah. We've been talking about NIF and the NIF system, uh, and we will continue that today. You remember this um, setup, right? We've been talking about the clubs, which is the core of the sports system. The clubs is where the activity happens. That's where the members are, yeah? And then we had uh, Siri here talking about uh, the regional confederations. What was their role? You remember? The role of the regional confederation. Anyone? Idris Kretsen? What are they said to do? Yeah. To make the money come that they get from the national federation to to the right places like football, handball, swimming. The yep. right under categories in the regional. In the region. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Anything else? 
Do you remember when we talked about the NIF line and the Federation line? What's the difference between the Federation line and the NIF line? This is specific. Yeah, sport. The development of sports, maybe? Specific sports. Whereas this, generally administrative, important uh, in uh, implementing sport policies. When we talk about sport for all afterwards, sport for policies, we will say that, of course, it's a it's responsibility of, of all of these, but the main, the main um, policy implementers are the ones on the, on the left side here. Clubs, national federations, are they members of NIF? Yes. How about the regional confederations? Are they members of NIF? Sort of? They're hired, they're the administrative, so these are actually employed, yeah? The same with the federation, regional federations. Kretsa, Sar Kretsa, or, re or, or regions, regiona, some people, or some uh, Sports have regions now instead of smaller units of what we used to call crets. <laughs> now it's regions. And these are also pointed by the national federations. But the clubs and the national federations are members of NIF. Thus they have a voting right in the general assembly. How often is the general assembly? Is it every year? Interesting, eh? Every second year? Every third year? Every fourth year? Yes, every fourth year. And what do they do there? What do they decide there? This is also what Siri talked about, and what we talked about the time before that. They have a strategical document, a sport political document, which is developed there, which runs for the next four years. There is a, a General Assembly this year will elect the next president, and then they will make a strategy <coughs> for 2015 until 2019, when the next General Assembly will be. So General Assembly, the General Assembly is the highest um, what's it, organ, or is uh, the highest, um, what do you say, the um, supreme governing body of the Confederation. What is in that document is the map that they have to try to guide the next four years after, okay? And then it's the, uh, it's the um, responsibility of NIF, NIF Centralt, the administration of NIF. We have the presidency, the board, and then we have the administrative part with the general secretary. And it's their responsibility that this document, those and uh, that four-year plan is being implemented in the organization, okay? So whatever happens to Norwegian sport uh, in the next four years is supposed to be in that document, and we need to direct whatever actions we take um, according to this document, okay? And that is, because it's a democratic organization, there is voting rights on the General Assembly from its members, the clubs, national federations, the board. So this is democratically, uh, a dem democratically driven process. Okay? And that's how we set the terms of the sports organizations. 
That's why things happened the way it does, because we all decided that's how it should be. Our representatives decides that. Is that a bit more clear to you now? Will you remember if I ask you next time? Good. Um, <coughs> so today we're going to talk a little bit about the national federations. In Norwegian we call them Sarfobund. Um, and they, naturally, they administer their specific sport. We have how many? We have 55 national sport federations in Norway. They administer each sport that we have, which is um, organized like that. Yeah? And that's not wrong because we have several national sports federations with that stands without NIF. Yeah, uh, under NIF we have these 55. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and that's what we're talking about now. But there are other. There are other, uh, would say, organizations that are not directly under NIF that is still uh, working for their sports. Do you have an example? Uh, Norwegian MMA Association. For MMA Association, for example. It's also true that although there are under NIF 55, it's not only 55 sports because some uh, national federations are responsible for more than one sport. We have one national federation uh, which is uh, responsible for American sports. Softball, baseball, etc., etc. Cheerleading. So there are more sports under one federation. But then we have many big federations or the largest federations are responsible for uh, only one sport. And most federations are responsible for only one sport. The sports federations, one of their most important tasks is to organize sports competition, official competitions. So any competitions that are official in Norway need to be organized under the National Sports Federation. Um, and also, which is a part of um, what makes this, um, as in sports in general, uh, you have employed people in the federations, in the administration, etc. And you have volunteers. And that is a challenge also in the, in the national federation, and in any organization really, which is a volunteer organization. Because there will always be, um, or not always, often be a tension between uh, who does what for free, or for the benefit of your children or yourself, whatever, and who is being paid for doing this. And that's, uh, we're going to talk about that later too, when we come to talking about volunteerism in sport and professionalization in sport, uh, where this is um, potential conflict areas. <coughs> in Norway, we see that there is a large variety in size of these federations. Uh, not surprisingly, the Football Federation and the Ski Federation are the largest ones. The Football Federation have 366,000 members, uh, mostly children and youth. And uh, the Ski Federation have 179, <coughs> which is the second biggest one. There are a couple, or not a couple, there are many double memberships here. So when we say that we have 2 point something, 1, 2.1, 2.2, million memberships in Norwegian sport, there are obviously people that are members of different federations. Any of you guys members of more than one? Yeah? Yeah, Norwegian Martial Arts Association and Kickboxing Association. Yeah. It's very common, at least on the, uh, for children. For instance, you're playing football during football season and then you're playing Humble or you, you ski during ski seasons. So that's um, part of the member, what do you say? Memberships can be, ex or the high memberships can be explained by that. The smallest units or the smallest federations thus far is the Softball and Baseball Federation, less than 1,000, and also the Norwegian Lug, Bobsleigh, and Skeleton Federation. 
Arkebosle skeleton. Only 232 memberships. That, of course, can ex be explained probably by the lack of facilities. Amongst other things, probably. Doesn't necessarily appeal to everyone and also um, doesn't really have that wide reach out. Um, but there is a high, um, there is a diversity in uh, sports federations, and y you can see that if you enter NIF's NIF's um, web pages, that there are there are many, many different, and uh, also the sizes and scopes varies a lot. You can uh, you can um, we can divide between the small units or small federations, which is less than ten thousand. The medium-sized one, then th uh, 10,000 to maybe 50,000, and the large ones, <coughs> over 50,000. And uh, the majority of federations are in the middle, between 10 and 50,000. <coughs> <coughs> so what's, okay, we know that they, they organize competitions, but what, what other tasks do these sport federations have? Quite a lot of tasks, actually, uh, and many of them are on the administrative level, organizational level. So when we talk about organizational development, what do we think about then? When I say, they say that they aim to make their organizations rational, they're rationalized, what does that mean? I know you know. What is a rational organization? To rationalize your organization. Anyone? <laughs> it's funny how everybody looks at the, <laughs> at the screen. Rationalization, guys. You knew in, in December. Most of you wrote that exam. Rationalization of sport. What does that mean? Martin, you remember? No? Anna? Karana? No? To make something more rational? To develop something? To make it more efficient? If you rationalize your organization, you try to find out how to make it more efficient. How do we, or, uh, how do we organize things so that we spend, for instance, less money so we can spend the money on something else? To make it, um, yeah, more efficient, to say it like that. And for the National Sports Federation, to make the organization as efficient as possible to rationalize is very important. Because the more you rationalize, you have this uh, amount of money that you need to use, or you have, have to use. The more you save here, the more you can, you can do there. And at the end of the day, what they want to do is to increase their memberships. So you need, uh, and if you increase your memberships, you become more popular, and you will get more money. So to organize, or to develop your organization, so that you can increase the memberships, to rationalize the organization and make it more efficient is very central to the sport federations. Okay? Another important aspect is the connection with media. And we got to do, again, it's to do with uh, memberships. Um, how, much, uh, how many of you are watching uh, cross-country skiing now? You know there's a, a world championships going on, right? Uh, 
many of you are watching uh, oh, I don't even know if there are world championships going on other things <laughs> but uh, how many of you are watching um, um, <laughs> I can't even remember, I can think of something yeah volleyball uh, cup finals <laughs> yeah we don't even know that it's going on there's it's no exposure in media there it's actually used to be on TV but I don't think it was this year so of course nobody watches it uh, it's not in the media and since I'm a volleyball player I can be a critical to the volleyball federation <laughs> They didn't, they didn't do a very good, at least uh, a few years ago, probably things are changing now. They didn't do a very good job when it came to media. They didn't expose. Uh, it's probably difficult. But they didn't expose it the way they could have, maybe, uh, to increase the memberships, etc., etc. I took an example now, maybe it's unfair, but still. Um, this information, media part, uh, of course, some sports are lucky because they appeal to a wide audience uh, but still it's a big part of the Federation's activities make this more attractive for more people if more people join more people will demand to see it and if more see it more people will join there's this ball that is running or rolling um, which is an important part so the Federation needs to give information about the sport and also have the connection to the media. And that's a very important part of what the federations do. <coughs> sport political work. First of all, to promote the sport, but also we talked about the sport political document. Essentially, we need to implement this in the organization. We have to try to implement this in the organization. We are responsible for letting our members get information on what, what, is the, uh, what are the policies now, how we're going to arrange this, how we're going to organize things. An important part of the Federation's activities. Every Federation is part of an international Federation. Uh, all of this is part of increasing membership, because as I said, that's the major task or, or desire for most of the federations. Um, so international con connections, super important. How do we make our national team, okay, maybe it's not good enough yet, but how do we have those connections so we can play against another national team from another country and get a little bit of uh, exposure because of that, maybe we'll get a little bit better, etc., etc. Events. The federations, are responsible for the official events. Uh, clubs can have uh, local events, etc. The Federation needs to be responsible for the events. They set the terms of the events. If it's international events, they are responsible for it. And national events as well. Uh, national championships, etc. And all of these, I don't have to say it at each bullet point, but all of these have the the motivation of increased memberships. That's what they want to do. They compete for members, more or less. Um, that's also what maybe creates the tension between these. Because there are, there is, of course, um, uh, not, not jealousy, but <laughs> there are some uh, federations that are are bigger and they get more attention. They are more powerful. They have more votes in the General Assembly. And that will, of course, create tensions. And you're going to see that later also in the, in the group assignment you're gonna, that you're going to do, or your exam. You're going to see this tension between um, what to prioritize, who should get what. Do we uh, give some somebody money or facilities according to size. Okay, what then happens to the small ones if you give the big ones that are already powerful something more, you know, etc., etc. Mm -mm -mm. Sports development, education. It's all got to do with the development of the actual sporting code. How about the integration of, of uh, disabled or differently abled? 
Is that visible in your specific federation? Do you see that in your specific federation? An emphasis on this. Anyone? What federation do you belong to? Football, most of you. Anyone else? Handball? Boxing? Kickboxing? How is the focus on, uh, on disabled in, football f in the Football Federation? It's an outspoken um, field of, um, what do we say, priority? As for you, the members, I think, of course, probably it's a big thing, but do you, the members, see this? Anyone? No, any initiatives? How about Humble? I don't see much of it. No? <coughs> I have a friend that plays for the deaf um, football long slog, what was it? Yep. Um, they, uh, and she, when they went to AM in Belgia or something, they had to pay for like all, everything. Hmm. The I think what many people think about uh, when they hear Sarfobund or National Sport Federation is elite sports. Because what we see of the National Sport Federation is very often represented by elite athletes at big tournaments or uh, competitions where we, we, we see that they actually are there, <laughs> participate. Elite sports is of course a very important part of the promotion of these federations. It's not the most important thing, but uh, of course, if you have a federation, it needs to distribute its money so that also it can lift the elites. I know that that is often also a tension uh, in the federations. Okay, you, there are t there's too much money put into the elites and they're not that good. And um, yeah, but we need to do that in order to develop. Yeah, but the development needs to happen here, on the grassroots, etc., etc. Very often, as you also saw in sport history, this has got to do with money. It's funds, it's money, and that's why the, the tensions and complications uh, arises. And, that this, and I'm sure that these discussions are also present in, in Germany and in France. This um, tension between the elite and the mass sport. Does elite sport contribute to a better mass sport and vice versa? And where do we actually distribute the money? Who gets what? Sport for development projects, what is that? Have you heard about that term, sport for development and peace? Yeah? More and more uh, federations, not by far all and not really all that many <laughs> but uh, they are um, also uh, attempting to contribute to sports outside of Norway and uh, these sport for development projects that they for instance try to implement in in um, the global or the south in Africa or Asia etc some of the sport federations are active here the Football Federation have one uh, project that has been going on for a long time, Football for Peace in Vietnam. You might have heard of it. I think many of these teams are also participating in Norway Cup. But that's one of those initiatives, sport for development projects. And this uh, field is slowly but surely picking up as well. 
So I'm sure that many of you, maybe, will uh, see more of this in the coming years. And we're also going to talk about that later, I think, in the last lecture or something. Sport facilities. If we want to do sports, we need facilities. The federations are not responsible, per se, for the facilities, because they don't pay for it. Who pays for facilities in Norway? How do we pay for them? Clubs. The clubs? Yeah. Do they have money to pay for it? No. Sponsors. Sponsors? Other things? State. The state? How? Can they just pay for a skating park indoor? <laughs> yeah, that's a good. Um, it needs to be in the budget, of course. Tippelatkilla uh, now. Lottery money. Norsk tipping. When does that? Uh, when was that implemented? When did we start uh, betting for uh, uh, betting on sport? You remember? Uh, yeah, just after the Second World War. We had a lottery that was developed. And the income of this uh, lottery money, this is, uh, this is a repetition for these guys, but you guys don't know it. So the income for this lottery money was supposed to be used on sport and sport facilities or cultural activities. And we still have that. So when we, um, when we uh, bet on sp or sports betting today, official betting, not online, and or maybe it's online, but it's not like those uh, commercial actors. But um, what we call norsk tipping, uh, facility building and all that is funded by those money. So the state distributes money to NIF and the sport federations get it from NIF Central and then they distribute to build facilities. You will learn a lot more about this. Um, now you have a... Um, a tiny peak, but it's um, this is very central. Uh, how money, how how this is funded, and it's going. You're going to work with it today, and this also uh, part of your um, exam. So you need to pay attention when we talk about these things. Integration, social integration. Part of the policy, and we will look at that later. Of NIF is sport for all. That's a central part of their visions. And what does that mean? Well, everybody should be given the chance to be doing sports in Norway. And actually, with this focus in the whole wide world, basically. But uh, the federations are responsible for their sports in their specific country. Which means uh, sport integration or social integration through sports may be uh, a way to... Um, to achieve the goal of sport for all. So many federations have uh, actions where um, these are, um, um, this is a focus. Also, anti-doping ethics, a part of the federation's work. Basically, the federation should inform athletes and contribute uh, when testing is being done. But in Norway and many other countries, we have an own agency, which is called? anti doping Norge. Norge, actually. <laughs> which is, uh, which is uh, responsible for um, the, um, yeah, the doping work, or anti-doping work, not the doping work, <laughs> the anti-doping work. So basically, uh, the federations uh, are doing information work, etc., and um, yeah, work together with anti-doping Norge. Norge. <laughs> ah. Last but not least, <coughs> each of uh, the Nor uh, national sport federations. Yes. It's illegal. Yeah, but now it's illegal. 
Anyway. For Monty Dupé? Um, I'm not sure actually. Uh, if you're in a federation, it's illegal yeah. anyway. Uh, but anti duping is, uh, I guess, more. They can't, they can't just come here tomorrow and test you guys, for instance. <laughs> but they uh, go, they go to the gym, as long as the gym is a member of uh, Rent. Uh. Hmm? No. Uh, no, but now they can. Uh, but uh, unless you're, uh, I, I think there is still, um, uh, I think, now I'm not, I'm not sure, but I think we can, we can try to find out in the break, but I think maybe the gyms have to agree to be a part of yeah, this, yeah? yeah? Uh, so, and if you don't agree, you will always be, you will always be in the, what do you say, mistanked, but suspected to be doing dodgy business, but I'm not sure, actually. If you, if you refuse to do a doping test uh, at a competition or a gym or anything, uh, you would actually be found guilty. Yeah. Automatically. Yeah. If you run away, you're like, you guilty. Yeah. Mm. Um, I don't know if we will... Um, I'm not sure about the other courses, but I think that we... Um, there should be there should be more about <laughs> this topic. Last year we had a, what was it, two years ago, we had a lecture from Monte Rupi Norge. Um, but I hope that we will have, uh, we will be able to have a lecture on this wor uh, kind of work. And um, I will talk to Guy, maybe we can even put it in this course. Um, yeah. Leg leg legislations, the last part of the National Sport Federation's activities, or last part of some of what they do. And that is basically to, um, what is leg le legislation? Le legislative, legislative work. That's, yeah? 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 Uh, <laughs> To make laws, to enhance, enhance laws, sports uh, has its own court of justice, Idrettens domstol. So it's not under our national uh, court of justice. Um, it has its own. We see that in doping, um, for instance, that it's the sport that is exclu excluding people from participating for two or ten years. Um, so part of the sport of federation's activities is to make, not make necessarily always new laws, but enhance the new laws. And that can be uh, tiny little things. Like uh, yesterday or two days ago, I was at the Volleyball Federation's uh, web pages and there are new rules for touching the net. And that's part of their job is to, of course, inform the members. Okay, now we're allowed to do this and that and this and that. So they're enhancing laws. And then there can be other things that is more local or national that they also need to, to make sure. So there, there's quite a lot of work that the National Sport Federations have to do. And of course, um, to illustrate, <coughs> to illustrate, this is, uh, this is where you find the National Sport Federations. If we uh, go into the Football Federation, for instance, um, <coughs> and we see employees in the Football Federation, you see there's a lot, 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 lot of people. And these are all set to work not only for the things that we saw today, but amongst other things for what we saw today. You see? And then, just to illustrate, a 
just to illustrate, this is a, it's a medium-sized federation. And these guys are supposed to do the same thing for their sport. So of course there will be differences. And so of course some, some federations will be stronger. And that's when we talk about the power structures in sport. That there will be, um, strong federations will be stronger and smaller will be smaller. And this is probably a big administration compared to other things. If we, w which was this one was the smallest? It was Arkebobskelten. I haven't been in and checked this. They probably don't even have employees. General secretary. And a board. Yeah, I haven't checked this, I won't. But still, these are tensions, will be tensions in sport. Um, we said that Norwegian sport is united. Yes, it is, and it's democratic, and it's also divided. There are different interests in Norwegian sports as well. And the strong ones are often stronger than the weaker ones, obviously. <laughs> NIF Centra, uh, Central, the administration, the board, they have a lot of power because they're, they are implementing the policies. And obviously what we see when we talk about NIF, what you see, you see those representatives, you see the general secretary, you see the president. And for an average person, a member of a tiny club, for instance here in Molle, it seems like a f quite a, a, a bit up to the, <laughs> to the president, yeah? Uh, but the NIF Central has a, uh, have the power centralized on top. Um, also the members of sport clubs, us, we don't feel like we have much authority. Although we are, it's a democracy, it's a democratic organization, but it's still, um, it's not like we go there and vote. Um, and like everywhere else, whoever is engaged will actually be the ones who make test the terms for the rest of us. And the rest of us can complain, but hey, we didn't do anything anyway. We didn't engage ourselves. Um, yeah, this will, also s will already illustrate a little bit that the small ones will have to follow the power because they don't have that many people working for those, those um, for their interests. Um, and also, the big uh, federations want more power. And they say that, okay, we need to decide because we, uh, we need to mo have more, uh, um, more to say in, for instance, distributing of the money. Because we have most, most members. Uh, but then, the smaller ones can say, okay, you have most members because you always get the most money. Because you, you know? We call this the, the uh, Matthew effect. Have you, heard, have you heard that word before? Matthew effect. Matthew's effect. When you talk about sports participation, I think you will do that with guide. You will probably hear about the Matthew effect. It's, uh, it comes from um, Matthew's, uh, from a, um, a story from the Bible. Matthew's um, kind of evangelia, what's it? Gospel, Gospel of Matthew, which says that the one who has a lot will get more, and the one who has little will get less. When it comes to sport, for instance, now we're taking a detour here, but when it comes to sport, talent, we say, oh, we have so many talents. If you listen to Twitter uh, yesterday, you would say that he would say that, yes, you have a, a pool of people, but everybody has the chance to be good. So that's a good, uh, that's a good uh, comment when it comes to this talent, uh, uh, the desire to harvest talent in Norway. But you have a pool of talents where, where, who you, s you think are talents. And then you give them, you select them, you say, hey, we give them the opportunity to practice with uh, a group that is even better. We need to, yeah, they need to stretch uh, or be challenged. So they get into this group and they practice even more. What happens is, of course, that they get better because they get more practice. The ones that are not as talented, that we think are not as talented, they don't get this opportunity to develop, okay, they can play here, but they don't get that opportunity. What happens is the Matthew effect. The ones that are already good, gets more practice, of course they become better. 
relatively. If you read, if you like to read, and people say, oh, you're a good reader. Okay, you read more. You become even better reader. Yeah? And that's the same <laughs> with sports or the sports federation. I'm big, so I get even more money to develop my sport. Okay, you become even bigger. The small ones, I can't say that I, uh, I, want this, um, I want this tennis court because we're only like 10 people in my tennis club. And that's not good enough for uh, the county to say, okay, you're only 10. How can we ba make a big tennis court for only 10 people? Yeah, but maybe if we had the facilities, more people would play tennis. No, 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 we'll, we'll make a football court here because everybody plays football. Okay, then more people will play football and less people tennis. On your um, exam, this is some of the tensions and some of the things that you need to have in mind when you answer the exam question. But I won't break to you quite yet because I'm not <laughs> done with it, but uh, you will get it on, my on, on Wednesday. Um, and at the basis of this, I will just have uh, one or two more slides before we, before we have a break. Is the sport for policies? In Norway, the government, and not only Norway, Germany too, England, Canada. It's in this, um, this book. I, I posted, uh, posted, <laughs> posted a chapter on Facebook. No, but I, uh, I put it on, um, what's it called? Fronter, yesterday, uh, on sport for policies. And all these, uh, you remember these four countries that were, um, that were uh, in the study of, um, of um, Berg score? Yeah? Canada, Norway, England, Germany. And they all have these sport for all policies. Uh, that is a co uh, government strategy to increase physical activity among its population. Government money to sports is not given to elite sports necessarily. It's given so that more people have the opportunity to do the sports. And uh, this is a very important task, and that's maybe the only reason why sport is being supported by government. You have this, uh, you have this um, idea that this is good for more people. We had this... Um, Earlier, we were talking about uh, what's the why, why does government support sport? Do you remember why? There were three reasons why governments supported sports. One was the, the cultural significance. It's important from a cultural perspective. National identity, etc., etc. The second, public health. Public health or that sport was a resource to, um, to other not sporting uh, outcomes or opportunities. For instance, public health, integra integration, etc., etc. And that's where this come in. They believe sport might be a means, of course, to get more people fit, but also for the, all, all those other things, integration, discipline, etc., etc. Uh, there used to be, uh, and there still is in this sport for development project, but they also used to be in Norway, and I think also Denmark, these campaigns uh, to give sports so people wouldn't, or, or the youth, would stay away from the street corners, you know? And that's the, yeah, th that's the government supported project because they think that sport might have that opportunity. Not because you're going to be elite athletes or develop sport itself. Doesn't matter which sport you do, it's for a social cause. And also, uh, the last one was the multi-dimensional uh, character, the, the fact that sport actually employs people and it contributes to a country's uh, economy quite heavily. But um, this sport for all is definitely a very central part of Norwegian and uh, European sport policy. Sport for all. You know the history, or at least you should. I won't ask you, I will ask you next time. So I hope that you you read it, so you won't sit there and mute. Um, and today, a large amount of, um, of the government money are ring fence or uh, what we call um, earmarked 
to go to projects that are contributing to sport for all. Not elite sport, but sport for all. And that's a very important uh, part of, of the government support. And who should implement this? Sport clubs, the regional confederation, the national confederation or federations of sport, they are uh, promoting their own or their own sports. Of course, sport for all is a part of this, but essentially <coughs> the main vehicles for implementing is the sport club on the grass route. So when we make a facility here in Molde, we need, you will see that next week when we have the excursion to Idretten Sus, we need to think that they should benefit as many people as possible. We cannot only make a specialized facilities for a few devoted uh, players only. We need to think that this should benefit as many as possible because that's the um, uh, mandate of the, the county, the commune. Okay, uh, you can have a break, 15 minutes, and then we'll uh, go on to uh, talk about the exam. We'll divide in groups, and we will then go on to work in groups. Yep.